All right, hi, uh, my name is Danny Diaz. Uh, we're gonna do a referee training video for the TCEA game, uh, Rubble Trouble. So Rubble Trouble this year, um, very similar to previous years in the uh, game pieces that we're using. The game pieces we have are red and black checkers. They are 10 a piece plus five of these PVC pieces. Um, the checkers themselves, um, the very standard checkers, the PVC tubes, they're Dura PVC pipes. Um, very important that you look at the PVC tube and say that there is raised lettering on the top of the PVC pipe and there's no raised lettering on the bottom. And so we're going to call that the bottom. The raised lettering is always up. Checkers, you've got a crown side, it'll have like a a crown, literally a crown on it. And the other side will have a star. The crown side is raised. The star side is uh, is is indented. Uh, it's concave. Um, what we're going to do first is we're going to talk about how this game is set up. So the first thing that you're going to do uh, when you come to the competition table is you're going to make sure that this table is actually set up. It's very important for <laughs> the game to make sure it's set up. So we're going to take PVC pipes and we're going to put them on each of these marks. So there's five PVC pipes, there's five marks on the board, one for each. That's great. Then you'll take two black checkers each and you'll make sure that they're both crown side up. You'll put them together and you'll put them on top of the raised lettering. So when you put these PVC pipes down, you make sure that the lettering is raised on the top. And so we'll take two each, take a pair of these, always make sure that crown side to crown side, both crown sides are up. So that's two on top of the ones in the middle. These two out here do not get the, the black checkers on them, only those inside there. Then what we do is we take the red checkers. Now the red checkers are going to be placed every other, so we start here where the, the arrows are and we start, we put a, a checker in the center, okay? So in the center here uh, along the, um, the, the length and then the center on the width on every other and always crown side up, okay? On every other mark, except we don't put one on the last mark. <coughs> Excuse me, oh boy, okay. So we are going to eventually place five of these checkers. Now the rest of the checkers, there's five red checkers. These will actually go to the team. Uh, there's, a, there's an element to this game where the kids, the team members, can actually place these checkers into the center here when certain uh, situations come up, and we'll talk about that later. But the five red checkers that are left, and these are called FAM, the food and medicine checkers. These five checkers go to the team. So you'll hand these to the team in some way, and then the team will take those. So what we have left are five, no, four, we have four black checkers left. Now, what we do here is we actually look at the blank spots that we have. We never put checkers on the last one on the end there. So what we're going to do is we're going to take, we're going to choose two of these marks at random. So let's take this one and we're going to put the checkers on. Now the checkers have to be centered along the width of, can they see this? The, okay, we're going to put it on the center of the width, but we, it doesn't matter where you put it on the length, as long as the checkers are not touching each other. So this is legal. I don't know if you can see this one here. Okay, you can. Uh, and then we're going to take, uh, well, let's just do this one here. And so we're going to play, put those checkers down. So that is a legal configuration. This would also be a legal configuration. And so on and so forth, as long as you don't put any on the end over there. Okay, so we're going to do this for now. So now, the ta and ignore these uh, sugar containers, because these sugar containers are just holding down the mat. Now, at the competition, normally, what you do is you take double-sided tape, uh, some kind of carpet tape or double-sided tape, and that'll be used underneath the mat to hold it down. But since we don't have that here, um, we're just using these sugar containers just to hold it down. So uh, ignore, pretend these sugar containers aren't here. 
Okay, so you've ignored the sugar containers, and this here is a completely set up field. Now, notice it took me um, about a minute to set this up um, when I'm discussing it with you. Hopefully it won't take you but, you know, 25, maybe 30 seconds um, to deal with this when teams are here and all the craziness is going on in the competition. So this is a set up field. Now when the kids get to the table, the first thing you do is you measure the robot. Do we have a ruler by any chance? Okay, so while we're getting a ruler, let me go ahead and, and discuss what we look at on the robot. The robot itself has to be only with the legal components, okay? Now we allow unlimited numbers of motors, so you can have, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten motors on the robot if you want to. Uh, with the NXT, you can only control, thank you, you can only control three at a time, but that's okay because what the kids can do is they can unplug and replug and do whatever they want um, in, in between, and we'll talk about that too. So you'll make sure that they have uh, unlimited number of motors and any kind of motors, it doesn't matter what kind of motors, and then sensors. Now the only two sensors we don't allow, and they can have an, an unlimited number of sensors too, um, the only two sensors we don't allow is we don't allow the infrared, okay there's three kinds of sensors we don't allow. We don't allow sound sensors, we also don't allow infrared sensors or magnetic sensors. So the sound sensors, you know, so that you can't clap or cheer or, you know, have external sounds mess your robot up. The infrared, we don't allow the infrared, and the only time the, you'll see an infrared is with the EV3. So this is an NXT. The EV3 is larger and bulkier and um, has these really annoying LEDs on it uh, down here. But the EV3 has uh, the infrared sensor. Now the infrared looks very much like an ultrasonic. Uh, this here is an ultrasonic sensor. It looks very much like the ultrasonic, except it has a black facing on the front. It sort of looks like it's got eyeballs, but the eyeballs would have like sunglasses on. Um, it it, it kind of looks like this, but it's got sunglasses on. And then it's got a little IR transmitter or receiver here in the, the top front. You can actually use a remote control on that, so we don't allow that in competition. And then the second, or the third one is uh, like compass sensors and magnetic sensors. Now we allow gyroscopes. There's a sensor that um, kind of looks like this sensor here, but it's got a black face, uh, a black face on the front instead of a button. And the sensor itself on the top has little arrows pointing that direction and then that direction. And that's a gyroscope, so that uses uh, angular momentum to actually measure um, how much the robot is turning. That's not a magnetic sensor. Um, a thing like a compass sensor is a magnetic sensor. Um, and the reason why we don't allow magnetic sensors is because if there's too much metal on the, on the table, like <clears throat> there's metal over here on the sides of the tables, or let's say I've got a magnet in my pocket, or some of the kids have a magnet in their pocket, or um, there's, there's a plate of metal underneath this table, it could actually affect the robot. And so we don't allow those because it's just so easy to affect the robot. So uh, we look at the robot and we say, all right, so legal parts, if I see something that's not Lego, okay, they have to have what's called a bill of materials. And a bill of materials will be a sheet of paper that has listed on it, this is what my robot has on it. Now, technically they're all supposed to have a bill of materials, but we don't generally give them any grief if, there's only, if the robot is only Lego parts. Okay, and we'll talk about some areas where we will give them grief, even if the robot is, isn't all Lego. But if you see something that's not Lego, uh, or you're not sure if it's Lego, you need to talk to the team and say, can I see your bill of materials? Pretty much all the teams are going to have a bill of materials, because they all want to be able to get points um, for some things on the board that we'll talk about. Um, the, the bill of materials is a, a big thing here. So they'll have a sheet of paper that'll have uh, this is all Lego pieces. There's an unlimited number of Lego pieces. That's all free. Um, I'm using a cup. Okay, so there'll be a cup on the thing, and it, the cup is worth five cents. Or I'm using PV, uh, I'm using um, cardboard on my robot, and that's worth you know ten cents a cardboard. And so you'll have it. You'll have it itemized. There's a specific format. Take a look in the rules. The administrative manual has the actual format that the uh, bill of materials needs to be in. So you'll look at their bill of materials and say, yes, that looks like a good bill of materials. Then you'll actually measure the robot. 
Now the robot needs to be, needs to fit within a 12 inch cube. That's 12 inches by 12 inches by 12 inches. Okay, so here's, here's a question for you. If the robot is only three inches wide, now this robot is something like six inches wide. If the robot is three inches wide, can the robot still be 14 inches long and still be legal? Because you know, it's a 12 by 12 by 12, can the robot be 14 inches wide, long and still, still be good? And the answer is yes. Um, it all depends on how you put the robot within that, that cube, you know, you're, you're making use of that diagonal because the diagonal, you know, is 1.4 times ish, 1.4 ish, the, the, the length of one of the sides. And so you can get away with, you know, if your robot is, is tapered just the right way, you could get away with almost a 17 inch robot. 17 inch long robot and still be legal. So definitely when you're, you're putting the robot, when you're measuring the robot, make sure you put the robot in the diagonal and make sure that the robot still fits within that cube. Doesn't matter how the robot's oriented to fit. You know, you do, then once you say that the robot is legal, then the kids can take their robot and place their robot on the board. Okay, you never measure the robot in its location. You measure the robot outside of being set up to make sure that it's legal, and then the robot goes into its location. Okay, now the robot always has to be set up so that a drive wheel is touching this rope. This is called the robot start zone. Okay, a drive wheel must be touching this zone. So that is a drive wheel, and a drive wheel. When you think about drive wheels, think about wheels that are somehow physically connected to the motors. So that if the robot is moving along and then you pick up the robot, that wheel will still be moving on its own. Okay, that's, that's a drive wheel. So I have two drive wheels on the front of this robot and then I have this non-powered caster wheel on the back. This non-powered caster wheel does not count as a drive wheel. These two wheels count as drive wheels. So that's it. So it's in there, and then the robot also has to be touching the back wall. So I'll just sort of swing my butt around, and I'm touching the back wall. So the, this robot is properly configured. Now there's two more things that the robot may have with it, uh, and those are two uh, what, what we're calling team supplied game pieces this year. The two supply, team supplied game pieces are a radio tower and a safety barrier. Now, what do I mean by a radio tower and a safety barrier? Well, those are game pieces that the team will eventually use on the game field, but there's no set specification for what those game pieces have to look like. There's only some restrictions for what the game pieces have to have. So let's, let's take a look at this here. So this is going to be my radio tower. Yes, this is going to be my radio tower. And then this is going to be my safety barrier. Now, the radio tower gets placed along either the center wall or the east-west walls. And we'll cover this in more detail later. But the, safe, the, the radio tower needs to be able to be, and, and safety barrier, need to be with the robot somehow. They need to be touching the robot, uh, mounted on the robot, um, whatever. It's part. These are considered part of the robot. So when you're measuring your robot, when you're measuring the robot, the robot has to have these pieces on it. So if I have this, like so, if I can get it to stay there. <laughs> uh, so if, if I have that, that's with my robot, right now it does not meet the size of the sizing restraints. So then we have to put this somewhere else. Okay? So these pieces have to have to be with the robot at the begin, you know, at the beginning of the match. And so they are connected to the robot. Okay? So these these game pieces are considered a part of the robot until they are no longer in contact with the robot. Once they're not in contact with the robot, then they're not considered part of the robot anymore. So let's say at the beginning of the match, I say three, two, one, Lego, and then they start, they start their robot, and this falls off, and then this falls off. Well, as soon as they lose contact with the robot, they're not considered part of the robot anymore, which means I can't touch them with my hands anymore. 
Okay, as long as it's part of the robot, I can touch them with my hands and move them around on the robot and put them however I want on the robot, um, just like any other game piece on the robot. With the robot, um, when the robot starts off, you can grab the, or the team, the kids can grab the robot and bring the robot back to base, back to the, the robots, I keep saying base, that's a first Lego League term, not a TCEA term. I can bring the robot back to the robot start zone and then put my robot back into position and then continue on. And when I grab the robot and pull it back, then I can, I can do whatever I want to my robot. I can take apart motors, I can unplug motors, I can change programs, I can do whatever I want. I can move things around on my robot as long as it's, it was already with the robot. But as soon as these leave the robot, they can no longer be touched by human hands, only by robot, okay? Okay, so the, the radio tower, and safety barriers. They may have more than one safety barrier or they may not have any safety barriers. It's completely, and we'll talk more about the safety barrier in just a minute. So, so this is a valid robot. Now, at this point, you've looked at their bill of materials and you've said, is the robot and everything with the robot on my bill of materials? Yes, okay, great, so it's with the bill of materials. It's very important that they have that you can ask them, hey, what's your radio tower and what's your safety barrier? And make sure those are on your bill of materials. They don't have to be called out separately on the bill of materials. You know, the bill of materials doesn't have to say robot, radio tower, safety barrier. It would be awesome if they did, but it's completely not required. And so it's just part of the, so if they just use Legos and their, their bill of materials says, I just use Lego pieces, great, then guess what, you're done. Um, then that covers everything. All right, so let's go ahead and say that, that I am uh, um, I'm a referee and I'm sitting here and I've done everything that I can and so I'm just going to wait. Actually, what I'll probably do first is I'll take my score sheet. So this is what the score sheet looks like. You might not be able to see it that well, but you'll, you'll have a score sheet and you'll have one score sheet for every team. The teams will come to the table three times um, so you'll have, at the end of the day, they will have been filled out three score sheets for each team. Usually they like to print out the score sheets in different colors to, to represent individual matches, but that doesn't necessarily, or individual rounds. So every time a team comes to the table, that's a new round for that team. Uh, generally everybody plays once, and then that's one round, and then everybody plays again, and that's another round, and then everybody plays again, that would be like the third round. We always play three rounds. And so you'll fill out a score sheet, and you know, hopefully you'll already pre-fill out, you know, the team name, the, the round, the referee, your name, the referee name, and then a table name if your table has a number, you know, like, this is table number two. That way the, the scorekeepers, you know, maybe they don't know who you are, but they know the table. They can say, oh, that's table 3A or table 3B, um, and so then you write down 3A or 3B, and then they'll come and yell at you if you mess up. Um, and that's okay. Everybody gets yelled at, even me. Okay, so you'll have your score sheet and you'll be ready to go. And then you'll have um, an MC or announcer or somebody, somebody will say, okay teams, let's go. And you're three, two, one, let go. And then the kids are allowed to start their robot. Now there's, there's a couple of different ways that the ro kids can start their robot. Okay, the kids don't have to start their robot at the beginning of the match. They don't have to if they don't want to. They can initially start the robot by pressing the, the orange button and then the robot goes that's fine they can wait they can already have the program running so they can start the program before the match starts as long as the robot doesn't do anything as long as it's just sitting there waiting so if it's just sitting there waving waiting they can wave their hand in front of an ultrasonic sensor and if they wave their hand in front of the ultrasonic sensor then the robot starts off that's fine too. It's a great way to, to do it very quickly um, and get the robot off if you want to shave those extra you know, nanoseconds off the, the time. Or the team can actually then take the robot. It's quite possible the team might take the robot and reconfigure the robot before they actually start the robot. Now that's, that's a little you know, crazy, um, but they can do that. Um, they can reconfigure the robot so let's say I, I take this and I put this in a different spot. Let's say I put that here and then I take the safety barrier and I put it on the tail. Now, 
Then the, ro the team wants to start their robot. Uh-uh-uh. Before they can start their robot, their robot, and this is new this year, so you might need to make sure that the kids understand this. This is new this year. It's, it's even in red um, in the rules. Before the robot can start, it must be within a 12 by 12 by 12 uh, starting configuration. It has to be, so if they reconfigure their robot, that is no longer within, within a 12 foot cube or a 12 inch cube. Uh, maybe if I take the cube and rotate it, but think about you know, how that might not be um, legal. If it's not legal, then you have to be very, very careful um, and, and let them know that, hey, your robot is not in configuration. You have to get it in that configuration. It used to be that the robot could expand, and so during play, when you start the robot and the robot starts moving on its own, the robot can get as big as it wants. It can do whatever it wants. It can open up claws. It can do, you know, open up uh, wings and start flying around the table if it wants to, whatever. But the robot, when you, if you touch the robot and bring it back, or the robot is in its starting configuration, the robot has to be within size. So the robot is now within size. I'm good in every, every dimension. And for this, generally, you just look at the robot. If the robot looks like it's out of size, then tell the kids, hey, that doesn't look like it's in size. If you know what it was when it was in starting configuration, and that looks relatively starting configuration, then don't worry about it, just let them keep going. Okay, really we don't want to stop them unless it is required. And if the robot is clearly outside of the configuration, then, then stop them. Okay, so now the, their, their robot is going to go and they're going to do stuff on the board. And there's, there's a number of things that they can do on the board. Um, I don't really want to cover all of the cases just yet. We're going to look at the end of the board and take a look at the score sheet and, you know, and we'll deal with that. But what I really want the referees to understand is what you have to do during the match. Okay, because during the match the, you're really an observer. Um, and, and first, you're an observer. Then second, you're a rules you know, maintainer. And then third, you're a best friend to say, oh, you almost got it. Or, you know, cheer them on. Yay, you got it. But first, you're an observer. So just remember that, that you need to be watching this game very intently. And you're an observer. Now, the team is going to be doing things. They're going to be pushing things around. They're going to be, um, you know, the robot's going to be moving around on its own. Don't, don't take the fact that I'm, you know, holding it um, to mean anything. So the robot's going to be moving around on its own, doing things on the competition field. There's really three or four things that you have to be watching for. Okay, the first one is a robot touch. Let's say you start the program, and starting the program is not considered a robot touch, okay? You start the program, and the robot starts to move. At that time, the robot is considered an active robot. Any touch, even if the robot is not moving in the direction the kids want, and they nudge it, that's a touch, okay? That's a touch. And at that touch, the robot has to come back to the starting location, and you take a time penalty. Now, the time penalty is very interesting. Um, let's say that the robot starts out and then the kids go to touch the robot. At the point of the touch, you start a time penalty. Now, how much time do you, do you give them? Well, that depends on how many times they touch the robot. So let's say this is the first touch. They touch the robot, you're going to give them a one second time penalty. Now, the one second time penalty comes in as soon as the touch. So then you're going to give them one Mississippi. And at that point, when you finish saying uh, one Mississippi or, you know, in Texas it's one Texarkana or um, whatever you want to do, you know, one second, two second, three second, and you you're need to get that, um, that cadence going. Or you can look at the competition timer uh, on the field and say, okay, one, two, three. Uh, however you want to do it, that's fine. But you give them a one second penalty. Now, one second on the touch, that's not really a penalty because it takes them one second to bring it back. 
So the first touch is not a penalty. And then you'll just go ahead and make a tick mark on your, your score sheet to say, okay, they touched it once. Or you'll just put your hand out and say, they touched it once. And then when they go and they touch, they, the robot then, you know, they do whatever in the robot, they start their robot, it goes out, and then they touch it again at the point of the touch. Then this is the second penalty. They get two seconds. So second penalty, two seconds. Third touch, three seconds. Fourth touch, four seconds. Really, it's not a penalty for them until they hit about the fourth, uh, the fourth touch. So you, you say one, Mississippi, two, Mississippi, three, Mississippi, four, Mississippi. And usually once they touch the robot, they're bringing it back. They're stopping their program. They're changing programs. They're hitting go. So even at four, the fourth touch, they're probably, you know, taking more time than what the penalty is worth. And so it really sort of gets into the fifth, sixth, seventh, uh, when it really starts to hit hard and you have to say, oh, you can't go yet, you know, seven Mississippi, eight Mississippi, uh, you know, into the eighth penalty. And then you just keep going. I mean, there's, there's no, I don't think there's a limit to the penalties um, that you can take. So it's really based on the time. And they only got two minutes during the match, right? So at two minutes in the match, if they touch it 10 times, then they've already eaten up something like 50 seconds. So 50 seconds of a two minute match, just in penalties, just in waiting, that's not good. Um, they, you probably won't get to 10 um, simply because of the amount of time that they have to wait, or you certainly won't get to 15, that's for dang certain. So, um, so the, we, we've talked about the penalties. The next thing that you have to worry about is transportation. Now this game, this game is really simple. Uh, when you look at what the kids have to do um, on, on you know, just first glance, the game is really simple. And so all it really bounds down to is moving things around on the competition field. I mean, that's really all they're doing. They're pushing, you know, game pieces from one, game items from one place to another, or um, <laughs> that's really it. They're moving things from one place to another. And so there are a couple of limitations that we've put into place uh, to slow down the pace of what's going on. Now, if they're smart and they think outside of the box, they can figure out ways to, to do things very quickly, okay? Um, because they've only got two minutes to do everything they're going to do on the, on the field. This is really a race against time. Um, but what we've done is we've said, all right, we're going to limit them to what they can do at once, just to make it so that the time is really the big factor here. So. What we said was, you can only transport one PVC piece at a time, just one PVC piece at a time, or you can, uh, and you can only transport one red checker, the food and medicine checker, the red checker at one time. And so let's say the robot comes out here and grabs and touches, is in contact with one PVC tube, and then they come and run towards the center, and their robot is now in contact with two PVC pipes, okay? These, uh, these safety pillars, as we call them. Now that the robot is in contact with two safety pillars, the robot has to stop. Immediate stopping point for the robot. The robot has to stop, and the, they, get a time, they get a touch penalty. That's an automatic touch penalty when they're touching two or more safety pillars. Okay, as soon as they touch them, it's a time penalty, it's a, it's a touch penalty, a time penalty, and their robot has to come back to the start zone. And you remove every game piece that the robot is touching, except um, the, the game, the team supplied. So if they, if it's still part of their robot, and these, these game pieces are still part of the robot, the team supplied, like the radio tower, and the safety pillars, those don't get taken away. Uh, as long as they're still with the robot. Um, but any game pieces that are on the field that are in contact with the robot get put in your pocket. They get completely taken off the board. They, it's done. It's gone. Okay? So we found that at, at some regions, that's what teams are doing to clear out some of this, this middle area, and that's perfectly legal. And so they're going to they're gonna come out touch one, touch the other, come over, you know, then we remove them off the field and there's only one left. And then they'll come in and then push this outside of the zone. That's, 
If you can clear this middle part out, that's worth points. So that's what teams are wanting to do. Same thing with the center here, with the center, with the red checkers. Now the black checkers, you can touch as many black checkers as you want at one time. But the red checkers, let's say they're coming over here to push, and then they're in contact with two red checkers. Now, what does it mean by contact? Um, contact, we're going to say that the contact is uh, contact by association. So if you're in contact, other than the mat, uh, we, don't do the, we don't use the mat, but if you're in contact with something, and then that thing that you're in contact with is also in contact with something else, then you're in contact with both. And so as soon as this robot is in contact with two red checkers, every, every checker and every PVC pipe that the robot is touching at that time then goes either in your pocket or off the table. This is just completely taken out of play. Okay, so those just got taken out of play. And then the robot can then push all of this out here. So remember that, that the robot can, can be in contact with as many black checkers as they want, but only one red checker. Now that doesn't mean that the robot can't be in contact with one safety pillar, the one of these PVCs, and a red checker. So it can be in contact with one of each, no problem. But as soon as you get two of the PVC pipes or the, the red checkers, then we've got a problem. Okay, then everything would go away if you're in contact with, with two of the same kind. Um, of these guys. But remember, you can be in contact with as many, as many black checkers as possible. Um, the next thing that you'll have to, to watch out for um, is the, their radio tower. So this, this I'm saying is my radio tower. Now, what is the radio tower itself is just a regular game piece. It's a, it's a team supplied game piece and it stays with the robot. Now, if the, team, if the team does that and then the robot moves away, that's just lost contact. The team cannot grab this. Even if they take a touch penalty with the robot, they can't grab this too because this has now left contact with the robot. The radio tower and the safety pillars, as soon as they, they leave contact, they're just like any other game piece on the field. You can't get it. Even if the robot comes back over, and make, re, regains contact, and then you grab the robot, you can't bring this back with you. Okay, so once it leaves contact, that's it, it's gone. Now, what the team is gonna wanna do is the team is gonna wanna take this radio tower and either place it on this wall, the, th this, is, this is the south wall, so then that makes this the western wall, that makes that one the eastern wall, and that makes this the north or the center wall. Now, when a robot places a radio tower over here on this wall, it's only worth 25 points, and it's only worth points for this team. Same thing goes with if this radio tower gets placed over here, it is only worth points for this team. But if they place the radio tower in the center, then it's worth points for both teams. Okay, and it's worth actually a lot of points for both teams. So there's a, there's a huge benefit for uh, the, the teams to place them here in the center. Now, the radio tower has to be a legal radio tower, which means that the radio tower has to, ha must, the radio tower must be, have all of its weight on the wall. Okay, if it's leaning up against the wall, that's not good enough because all the weight is not on the wall. It must be fully supported by the wall. Here, in this situation, it is mostly supported by the mat. That's not good enough. Must be fully supported by the wall. And it must be six inches tall. And in my case, uh -huh, it is six inches tall. And that's measured from the top of the wall. The top of the wall should be the same on, on any wall, okay? The, the center wall is raised up a little bit to, in order to, to meet the top of the wall. So the, the radio tower, just take it and look at the top of the wall. Whoops. Look at the top of the wall. Is it, is it at least six inches up? Yes, then you're good. Okay. Now, I did say that you have to look for things during the match, and so here it is. During the match, if this team 
places the radio tower on the wall and then their robot's no longer in contact with it and it is clearly up and it's not like, you know, um, doing the whole basketball going into the hoop, but maybe, maybe not. You know, it's, it's sort of dangling here. As long as it settles down and you've placed and the team has placed it on the wall and it's all good, then that is worth points for both teams. Now the second team can absolutely come in here and knock it off. So if the second team comes over and knocks it off, this team still gets those big points. This is still considered hang uh, up. This is still considered being up here for this team, but not for this team. So if the opposing team doesn't want those points, they can come over and knock it off. That's fine. Now what happens if you place this, if this team places the radio tower, and then the robot goes off and does whatever, and then as it's coming back around, its tail comes over and knocks it down. By accident. It's completely, you know, and the team's devastated, right? And it, it gets knocked over. Well, that means this team does not get the points, but this team does. They still get those points because it was knocked down by no, through no fault of their own. Okay, so you have to be watching that radio tower, and if that radio tower gets knocked down, you have to figure out who knocked it down, and then whoever knocked it down does not get the points. Now, the, uh, the opposing team, the, the, and I say opposing, but really these teams are working together to get a radio tower up. So there might be two radio towers on the center wall. There could be a radio tower put up by this team, and there can be a radio tower put up by that team. That's great, but only one radio tower counts. And so it's the one that counts. Now, if this radio tower is here, up here, let's say this team puts a radio tower up here, and then this team puts a radio tower up here, then what actually happens? Well, this, this uh, side, on the sides here, these are just for this team. Just for this team. And so by just having this for this team, they negate any shared points that they may have gotten. So if there's one on a side wall, then the team that put it up on the side wall, that's all the points that they can, they can possibly get. You do not look at the center points at all. So the center points are completely off, off the table for this team, but this team over here, the opposing team, then would get the shared points for the center being on the center wall. Okay. Hopefully that's not confusing. Um, and so really, that's all you have to, oh, there's, there's one more thing. So as soon as the center, as soon as this center circle, the inside of the center circle, the circle is not considered part of the game, Matt, or part of this inner area. So as soon as the interior of this circle becomes clear, then the team can then start using those, remember those five checkers you gave to the team, those five red checkers? The team can then start using these. And so they can place one red checker on any of these three spots. So I want to say right there. Okay, so as, as long as this is cleared out, they can take one checker and place it on any spot. Now, that's any spot. Now that that is inside there, the area is not clear, so they cannot put another one down until this gets moved out. And so the teams are likely going to then, you know, the robot's going to come around and it's going to then pick up this red checker and then put it into the safety zone. So this, this uh, rectangle here is called the safety zone. This is where the majority of the checkers are going to end up. Okay, and remember I said you can only touch one red checker? Well, that was you can only touch one checker except in the safety zone. So if they're pushing these red checkers over here to the safety zone and then they touched another red checker, that's okay as long as they touched it in the safety zone. Okay, that, that's very important, something I left out before. Uh, they, can, they can be in contact with as many red checkers as they want in the safety zone, but let's say they take these PVC pipes and they put them into the safety zone. If they come into contact with two PVC pipes anywhere on the board, then those get removed as well as anything else they're touching. 
uh, with anything else this robot is touching. Now that does not include checkers that have been sucked up into the robot. So the, there's uh, the capability, and we'll take a look at it for um, the, the safety barriers, the, the, the mission where you're containing rubble. And so the black checkers are considered rubble. They're, they're radioactive or you know dangerous, they're bad. And so the robot can come over and pick these up and put them into the robot. These are now, once they're picked up, and they're in the robot, these are now considered part of the robot. So when you're, when you're going to issue the penalty of, hey, now we're touching, or, well, now you're issuing the penalty of, now you're touching more than one red piece outside of safety zone, um, then you would remove these from the, from the robot and anything else that the robot may also be touching except the ones that are inside the, the black checkers that might be inside the robot already. And by inside, by, by being contained inside, that means that these black checkers are not touching the mat, but they are touching the robot. Very simple. Okay. So let's go ahead and, and get a, a scoring scenario here. And um, let's, let's, let's score it. So I'm going to place... And okay, so let's let's look at this scenario for a team, and let me grab a score sheet, and we'll go through the score sheet. So if the team leaves the, the field in this configuration, how will we score it? So uh, we'll go down the sheet, um, and for the sheet here, um, you're going to put uh, there. There's three columns to the score sheet. There is the description column, and um, Yes, I could have made that text smaller. Uh, I know, I know. It's a, it's a bit of a, uh, an eye chart there. It's really hard to, to read some of it. But um, the, first, the first column is the description. The second column is um, sort of the field state. And then the, the last column is the points. Um, and so what you'll do is like in erect a radio tower on a single wall. You'll say erect a supported tower, radio tower on the east or west walls. That's the, the west or east walls. There are none here. You circle no and you put zero points. Easy. Have a legal radio tower on the center wall. On the center wall. Doesn't matter who put it there. Um, it doesn't matter who put it there then you'll say, yes, there is a legal, there is a scoring tower on the center wall. You'll say yes, and you'll put 50 points. So that's worth 50 points. You'll put 50 points. Um, now, it, it says re requirement, only one of these can be selected. So that means you can only have either on these walls or the, or the center. Remember I said, if they put them here, then they don't get the points in the center. And they must have a legal bill of materials. Even if they did not put the, the tower in the center. Let's say this, the opposing team put the tower in the middle. This team can still get points for those, that tower as long as this team has a bill of materials. And if the robot is just Lego parts and all they need on their bill of materials is to say Lego parts unlimited and, and be in that format that is correct for the bill of materials, then they can share in these points. So it's a shared mission. The 142, remove safety pillars from the FAM drop zone. So this, this circle is the FAM drop zone, the food and medicine drop zone. And so remember when we, we said when this is cleared out, a team can then place a red fam uh, into onto one of those spots, well that you're dropping it in there. So that is a human action to drop it in there when this is completely cleared out. This is called the fam drop zone. So yeah, there are no safety pillars within the, the fam drop zone on the, the inner circle. And so you'll look at it and we'll say, well there is, there is one in here. And so you'll say, no, there are no <laughs> um, safety pillars. So it's sort of a double negative, but you'll say no and so then you'll you'll say it's zero points because there is one in here. And you'll say zero points for that. Okay. Support the weakened warehouse structure. Uh, weakened structure marks. So these 
These marks on the table here are called the weakened structure marks. So the weakened structure marks touching an upright safety pillar. So let's actually modify this just a hair. All right. So we're going to say how many structure marks are touching uh, an upright safety pillar. So this one, this mark, no matter where, where this pillar is on the mark, this mark is touching. That's one. Well, now we've got another mark. We've got another mark that is also touching a pillar. However, only marks with only PVC touching them can score. This mark still has a checker touching it, so this mark does not count. Only that mark counts because that's the only one that only has a pillar touching it. Okay, so if, it's, if it has anything other than a pillar touching the mark, then it does not count. Even if it's black rubble, even if it's rubble, that still does not, if, if the situation was like this, that also would not count. So we have to put one. So then in the blank here, we'll say one times 10. And then over here on the right hand side, we'll say 10 points. And then three or more marks touching upright safety pillars. And now that remember this says upright safety pillars. So the safety pillar has to be upright. That would not be a scoring safety pillar. Okay, it has to be it has to be upright. That is not a scoring safety pillar. That is. Now what about that? Is that a scoring safety pillar? Yes. Well, we don't when it comes to this, we're not going to mince words on, you know, what's up and what's down. So that's down, that's up, but it's upright. That's not upright. And it's not even touching anymore, it rolls away. So that's upright. And then we say bonus, there's a bonus for three or more. So are there three or more? No, there's only one. So if, if these checkers weren't here, if those checkers weren't there, then you would have, well, let's say that they are uh, there. If we have that scenario left, then you would have three, and then we would say yes. There are three or more that are scoring, and you say yes, and you put 50 points. All right, deliver FAM, food and medicine, to safety zone. So we count now how many food and medicine are in the safety zone. Now, when we say in the safety zone, we actually mean in the safety zone. This is the safety zone. If it's, it's in, as long as some part is going across the line, that checker is considered in. That checker is also considered in. This checker is considered in. This checker is also considered in. We don't put an airspace, we don't put a maximum limit to the airspace above it. it. As long as it's in the airspace, that is in. Okay, so that one's in as well. So all four of these are in. And so then we would say four. Uh, we would say put a four down. We would say then that's times 10. Come over to the points and say 40 points. Um, have eight or more scoring fam in the safety zone. So are there eight or more scoring fam in the safety zone? No, there's only four. So we say no, and that's worth zero points. Um, and then containing the rubble, the, the um, one, four, five, contain rubble. So the containing the rubble can happen in one of two ways, and only one of two ways. So on the robot, in the robot, we have three checkers. Okay, the robot picked these checkers up and did and put it inside the robot. All right, and then we also. Oh, wait a second. Um, right. Okay, and then you can also take safety barriers, which I just did this. Now the safety barrier is defined as anything that surrounds the um, the the rubble. 
okay? Anything that surrounds the rubble, it has to completely surround the rubble. That completely surrounds that rubble. If there were two rubble inside, that still completely surrounds those two rubble. If this is like that, then that only completely surrounds one of the rubble, okay? So it has to completely surround the rubble. Now, does it have to completely surround it on the table? No. This can actually be up here. And as long as you look at the table from a bird's eye view, can you say that this surrounds the rubble? You know, if you look at it down from here, does that surround the rubble? If you can say yes, then they get the points for it. Okay? So it doesn't have to just be down here. It could be up here. This could be like this. Okay? It, as long as it surrounds the rubble, and that's, that's going to be one of those judgment calls. Okay? If you can look at this isn't much of a judgment call, you can just say, hey, that definitely does it. But let's say, and this is, this is my favorite, let's say you did a dual purpose. I'm placing two checkers, and you can't see it because of the camera angle, but I'm going to place two checkers right here, and then I'm going to bend this down like that, okay? Now, assuming that I'm still tall enough, okay, assuming that I'm still tall enough, this circle will, and, and let, me, let me do this over here so you can see it better, okay? Pretend this is the center wall for, for just a moment. Okay, so there's, there's my radio tower. Okay, it is six inches. It scores as a radio tower. But this, this, this loop hangs over and there's, uh, there's two checkers down there. This is considered also a safety barrier. So you can have the radio tower and safety barrier in one object if you want. That's perfectly fine, as, as long as the team wants. And we, we evaluate these separately. So we evaluate it as a radio tower, check radio tower. Then we can evaluate it as a safety barrier. Does this completely surround these checkers? Yes, it does. So it's worth points. Okay, but you can only have one of each, each checker has to be evaluated separately, okay? So if we evaluate the first checker, we say, yes, it's inside. We evaluate the second checker. Yes, it's inside. We evaluate one of the checkers out there. No, that's not inside of a safety barrier. Um, and the safety barrier has to be part of what you brought to the table with the robot. You can't use the walls as a safety barrier, but you can use the walls to hold it. So if, if the checkers are pushed against the wall, that's okay as long as there's a safety barrier above it. Or if I took this across it, right? So these two checkers are still within the safety barrier, within the outside edge of the safety barrier. But we also have this safety barrier. It's two safety barriers for the same two checkers. You're still only counting each checker once. Okay? Now, what about this robot here? This robot has two checkers contained. So what you'll do is you'll say, the number of rubble surrounded by legal safety barriers, that's two. There's two checkers surrounded by legal safety barriers. And the rubble contained within the robot, there are three rubble contained within the robot. Now, what if a team decided to be cute and take a safety barrier and put it around the area in the robot where the robot is holding checkers? Can they get points for both? The answer is no. They can only get points for one. And so we look at, is it in the robot? Yes. Then they, they get points for in the robot. That's it. They get points for in the robot. They would not get points for the safety barrier as well. Okay, they only get points for one. And you sort of look at it in precedence of, you know, what can you say that it's within? Is it within the robot more than it's within the safety barrier? Yes. It's within the robot more than it's within the safety barrier. So if it's in the robot, it's in the robot. If it's in a safety barrier, not in the robot, then it's in the safety barrier. And then the last one here is no checkers within the warehouse zone. So this, this rectangle that encompasses this whole area here, this big rectangle, 
is the warehouse. So there's right now, there's four checkers in the warehouse. And so then we'll say, no, it's not cleared out and that's worth zero points. But if this was like that, then we would say, and oh, there's one. See, this checker is in the safety zone and in the warehouse. So there's a checker still in the warehouse. So this checker would have to be like that. And so now, there's, the ch there's no checkers in the warehouse, so you could say, then say yes. And then, of course, um, every team starts off with 100 points. But there's one more thing, I think, that I may have left out, either of the rules or of contain rubble. Hang on a second. Nope, that was it. Okay. All right. So then you go ahead. You don't have to tally up the points. You know, after once referees have gone an entire day, you're generally zapped. Um, even by lunchtime, you can be zapped. I know if you're doing the, the region one, the area one, um, where we have, you know, 15 tables and we're going nuts, um, I don't want you to have to do the math there. Um, but if you, if you feel comfortable doing the math, um, you know, all the math should be in fives and tens. It should be pretty easy to do the math if you can. Then go ahead and do the math. If not, then just let the scorekeeper deal with the math. Um, and then um, you go ahead and, and just have the, the, make sure that the second column is filled out because that's what's really important. There's scoring software that I provide for the tournament, and we just look at the, um, the, the second column and then it'll calculate points for the third column and then we'll write in the points for the third column. We'll verify the third column points. Um, and then we'll have the grand total. Make sure that the team, every team should have a captain of the team or someone who acts as the captain. And so then have them put their initials here once, and you need to let them know that once they put their initials, this score sheet is set. Unless this score sheet says something crazy like that there were um, 17 um, black checkers inside of safety zones, which would be awesome for them, but <laughs> they can't do that. As long as there's something here that's not just crazy wrong, then it's it, then this is set in stone, and the the score sheet can't be changed unless we find that there's a reason to to change it. Um, all right. Well, I think then at at once this is done, then the kids can grab their pieces. Make sure they grab all of their robot and their game pieces. Make sure they leave you your pieces, okay? And then they'll move off and then you'll hand the score sheet to someone who's running up um, to get your score sheet or you'll hand it to the, to the scorekeeper and then the next team will come up and you'll reset the board just like normal. All right, well hopefully uh, I've demystified the, uh, the, the referee challenge for this year. Um, the game itself, uh, I didn't really cover the game in, in full, but that's okay. Referees generally don't have to worry about most of what happens, you know, with the robot in the game. Just those four things that we talked about. You know, we talked about robot touching. We talked about being in contact with more than one safety pillar at a time. We talked about being in contact with more than one uh, red checker at a time. And we talked about the uh, interaction with the uh, radio tower and who, you know, who places it up and then who eventually knocks it down. Um, and then we also talked about um, the exception for the red checkers in the safety zone. Um, and hopefully that should be everything that you need to know. Um, all right, thank you very much.